Let's look this morning at this text in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'd like to revisit for some of you this passage. All of the Bible is my favorite, but there are certain passages that you return to when you need to hear a word from God. All right. And this is one of those passages for me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, written by the Apostle Paul as he writes to the church at Corinth. This is one of the most endearing of all of the writings of Paul as he self-discloses some of those intimate things in his heart and the great love and the great compassion that he had for the church in general, for the church at Corinth in particular, but also as he shares some of his own burdens and troubles and disappointments and setbacks. And as I read these passages, of this passage of scripture, my spirit never ceases to be lifted and encouraged as Paul speaks about what the ministry means to him, the service of the Lord. And I want to talk to you from the subject of why we don't lose heart, mm -hmm. why we don't lose heart. All right. Paul opens this particular paragraph by saying, therefore, seeing we have this ministry. Uh -huh. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. Paul viewed his life as a ministry as a service, and everything that he did in his life was to discharge his ministry, to discharge his service to the Lord. To the Philippians, he wrote and he says, I'm trying to lay hold of that for which God laid hold of me. All right. To King James, he says, I'm trying to apprehend. All right. It's uh, a law enforcement term. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to apprehend. We're trying to apprehend the criminals, Brother Cox. Paul says, God apprehended me one day. He laid hold of me. And there was a reason or purpose for which God laid hold or apprehended me. Now Paul says, the preeminent ambition of my life is to lay hold of the purpose and the reason that God laid hold of me. You see, he saw his entire life as a pursuit of the purpose to which God laid hold of him first and given him life, laid hold of him again and given him eternal life through faith in Christ. So Paul says, we don't faint, we don't lose heart because we have a ministry. Mm -hmm. If you are a Christian, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a minister. Yeah. Amen. You have a ministry. That's true. And you may not be called to a pulpit ministry. Right. You may not be called to sing like Dr. Davis or to play like the young lady or to sing like Sister Day or Sister Scott or other members of the choir. But if you are a Christian, you have a ministry. True. And if you are a member of the Grace Bible Church, then you are an integral part of what takes place here. True. Every person that is saved through this ministry, you are contributing to that person being saved. True. Everyone that is encouraged, every individual that we help, every child that's taught in Sunday school, you participate in that endeavor. You have a ministry. And knowing that we have a ministry, it gives us a sense of significance a sense of purpose. Life is more than just some cosmic joke that God is playing on us. All right. To know that we have a ministry and that we have been called to the ministry. So Paul says, knowing that I have a ministry, mm -hmm. knowing that suffering is not in vain, sacrifice is not in vain, hardship is not in vain, disappointment and setbacks are not in vain because I have been called to a ministry. True. Now in this life, you are going to suffer. Amen. The only question is, will you suffer as a Christian? That's right. And will you suffer trying to do God's will? That's it. Or are you just going to suffer because you're a member of the human family? Mm -hmm. Paul says, because we have a ministry, yes. we don't faint, we don't lose heart. No. And he says, with the ministry, God accompanies the ministry with mercy. True. Don't you know that God grants you the mercy, the divine favor? That God provides you with the spiritual octane that you need to discharge the ministry that he's called you to. True, true. Paul says we don't faint, we don't lose heart, because our life has purpose and meaning, because we have a ministry, and God provides us with the mercy to execute and to discharge the ministry that he's committed to our trust. Ah. So we don't lose heart. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God is a God of mercy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm glad as the writer of Hebrews says, we can come boldly unto the throne of grace and there obtain mercy 
and find grace to help us in our time of need. I don't know about you, but I don't want justice from God. I don't want justice from God. I want mercy from God. I don't want fairness from God. I want mercy from God. And Paul says that with the ministry, God provides us with mercy because God understands that our very best, we are colossal misfits. Yes, sir. God understands that our very best, we are bumbling idiots. In all of our erudite wisdom, in all of our intellectual prowess, God understands that we're really spiritual idiots. So God provides us with the mercy that we need so that our ministry will make sense. Don't you know that ministry does not make sense without mercy? That ministry does not make sense without the anointing of God? It doesn't make sense. Serving God doesn't make sense without mercy from him to accompany you in your service. So Paul says because we have this ministry and because we've obtained mercy, we don't lose heart. We don't fail. We don't grow weary in well-doing because we know that in due season we are going to reap if we faint not. Jesus. And Paul says the ministry and the mercy and the anointing, it causes us to walk and to carry ourselves with a certain spiritual integrity. Mm -hmm. yes. And one of the missing things in the Christian them today is spiritual integrity. Mm -hmm. And as I share with you in recent weeks, we've got to produce better Christians. Mm -hmm. We've got to produce better Christians. Only Bill Gates at Microsoft can put out products on the market they know that don't work and let you and I figure it out as we're struggling on our computers trying to do word processing and spreadsheets and figure out this stuff isn't working right. They don't people can get away with that. In the church, we got to produce bona fide, high caliber, high quality Christians with integrity. We got to roll out of the center line of the church peoples whose lives have been changed by the power of God. So Paul says, there are no excuses for living loose and living irresponsible lives just because you're going through difficulty or hardship. God still calls us to, a, to the high plane of spiritual fidelity. So Paul says, we can't just handle the word of God any kind of way. We can't just say anything that we want to say to tickle people's ears. We've got to be diligent to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of truth, that we give people a, a ready answer in due season. Amen. We can't just stand up and tell people what they want to hear, that they're going to drive a Rolls Royce or Mercedes Benz and wear designer clothes because that's the popular message of the day. We've got to tell people the truth. In this life, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, Jesus says, for I've overcome the world. Are you following me? Paul says we cannot handle the word of God deceitfully. We cannot look at people and tell them everything is going to be all right. Just live any way that you want to live. I was in the, the optometrist's office this past week with my daughter, and a magazine caught my eye. It's the January the 31st edition, I think, of Newsweek. And the caption reads something to the effect that uh, hell really isn't so bad. <laughs> and on the front cover of Newsweek, I got it downstairs from my study. I'm not making this up. On the front cover of Newsweek, they have this caricature of Satan. And so Satan is dressed up and he has the horns, and, and, but he has on dark glasses. And he has a, a big glass of some type of drink with a straw in it. And he has this Cheshire grin on his face. In the backdrop of that particular picture, there's a, a, these people who are on the beach playing volleyball. And over in one corner, there's a picture of people laying on their lounge chairs, and one of Satan's demons is catering them fresh drinks. So the captain reads that hell really isn't that bad. As you go and read the, the, the meat of the article, it talks about, well, hell really isn't a real place, what these new theologians are saying. No, it's just a state of mind. That's really all it is. And so what they've attempted to do is to explain away the reality of a literal hell, a place that burns with fire that is unquenchable and where the memory never ceases. Now, we can tell people that hell really isn't so bad, but Jesus says that hell is a place to be shined. That he calls people to repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. So just because it is no longer popular to preach on hell, we cannot silence the message because the Bible is clear. 
Paul says we have a ministry, we've got mercy, but we also must do it with spiritual integrity. Mm -hmm. But Paul goes on to say another reason that we should defame, not only because of the ministry and because of the mercy, but because we have a message. We have a real message. We have a message with content. It is not just rhetoric. Our message is not just, I'm okay, you're okay, we all okay. No, Paul said we have a message. It is a glorious message. Verse 4. He says, the God of this world, Satan, wants to blind the eyes of those who do not believe. To keep them blinded to their need to be saved. To keep them blind to their need of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. To keep them blind to their, their need for a change of life. He says, the God of this world keeps people blinded. He says that we have a glorious message. It is a glorious message about Christ. That Jesus Christ saves from sin. Mm -hmm. That Jesus Christ can change people's lives. That Jesus Christ can make old things new. For if any man or woman is in Christ, they are new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, that's a glorious message. Mm -hmm. The change is possible. Most people that I know want to change. Mm -hmm. Most people that I know desire to be better people, to be a better person. Yes, Most people that I know would long for forgiveness and a sense of, of being pardoned by God. And the message of the gospel is that there is indeed hope. There's hope for the hopeless and for the helpless, for the hurting, for the disenfranchised. It is a glorious message. It's a message where there's no partiality. It's whosoever will, let him come. Let her come and drink of the water of life freely. Amen. We have a message. We have something to say. That Jesus Christ saves. He still saves. His blood has not lost any of its potency or power. That Jesus Christ saves because Jesus Christ lives. Mm -hmm. And the message of the Bible it is still relevant. It speaks to us with perennial freshness. It is not outdated. It is not antiquated. We have a message. We have a message for our young people to say to them, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that he's able to keep that which you commit to him. He's able to sustain you, to help you, to maintain your moral purity. We have a message to say to them. We have a message to our young people say, if you put your faith in Christ, if you live for him, if you set up and decide that you're going to serve him, that God will lift you up and he will elevate you and give you a, a platform, a forum in which to speak of the unsearchable riches of Christ. We have a message for them that, that, that serving God may not pay at the end of every day, but in the end it pays. Because God is the master accountant and he will never be indebted to anyone. The serving God will pay off after a while if you're serving faithfully. We have a message. Yes, Lord. We have a message to men who are wondering whether it's worth it to try to remain faithful to wives and children and to sacrifice in the marketplace that we call work to try to do the right thing. We have a message for them that God has entrusted to you a family and God is holding you responsible for that family. And one day you've got to stand before him and give account to God for your family. And God is not going to be concerned about how much you got in your 401k or how much you got in your retirement plan. God wants to know that you stay faithful to your family. That you train your children up in the nurture and the happiness of the Lord. That's what's going to really count at the end of the day. That's the message. We have a message to women, mothers who are trying to raise their children. Some of them will have to work in the marketplace as well as trying to be keepers of the home to tell them to keep on serving God and keep on trusting God because God is going to help you to accomplish that which he calls you to do. We have a message. Amen. Amen. It is a message that is relevant. Yes. It is a message that speaks to us at our point of hurt, our point of need, our point of frustration. We have a message to those young people who are slinging drugs out on the street, young girls who are prostituting their bodies. What you're looking for will not be found on the street. It can only be found in Christ. Amen. We have a glorious message, and we ought to be quick to disseminate it. We ought to be quick to share this great, glorious gospel of Jesus Christ Amen. to everyone that we see without a shame and without apology. Amen. True. We must stop apologizing as Christians. Stop apologizing for believing that Jesus Christ is the only hope of glory. 
to stop compromising and telling people, well, maybe psychology will help you too. No, you need Christ. Amen. He's the only hope. He's the only answer. He's the only one that can be peace for your troubled mind. He's the only hope for your way with children. You can run from psychiatrist to psychiatrist, social, social scientist to social scientist. At the end of the day, at the very best, they're guessing. Amen. And they're hoping. Right. And they're wishing that they do something that comes out right. Amen. We have a message. Amen. It's a message yes, it concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Paul said, we don't lose heart. Right. We don't faint. We don't flinch and we don't back down and we stand boldly, courageously, and without apology. Yes, calling men and women and boys and girls to repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. We don't lose heart. All right. Not only because of the ministry, the mercy, and the message. Mm -hmm. Paul says we don't lose heart because we got a treasure. Right. We got a treasure. Yes, sir. Verse 7. Paul says, we have this treasure All right. yes, sir. in earthen vessels. Yes. Now stop right there. All right. Paul says that God has deposited a treasure That's right. in an earthen vessel. That's an oxymoron. Yes, sir. That's a paradox. That's a contradiction. No. You, you don't put treasures in clay pots. That's the literal translation. All right. All right. Paul says, we have a treasure in a clay pot. Yes, sir. Now, if we have a treasure, we're going to take it to the vault somewhere. And we're going to put it in a safe somewhere of safekeeping. But Paul says in the economy of God, mm -hmm. God has deposited a treasure in a clay pot. Amen. And the clay pot that he speaks of was his own body, his own vessel. That's these it. old clay pots. That God has put a treasure in these pots. Mm -hmm. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. There's something about clay. All right. Clay can be molded. Clay can be shaped. And if for some reason if you start out with a piece of clay and if you're trying to make it into one thing and that doesn't work out, you can just crush it and start all over again. <laughs> see, 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 clay does not resist the, the hand of the potter. Are you following me? Right. And what God is looking for is just some old pieces of clay, just clay pots. Folk who are satisfied with just being an old piece of clay. But if you take a piece of clay and you put it in the hand of a master potter, uh -huh. right. a master potter can take an old piece of clay and make a masterpiece out of it. Yes, and God is in the business of taking men and women, boys and girls who recognize the frailty and the weakness and the fragility of their own lives and realize I'm just an old clay pot, just an old clay vessel, not worth very much. Maybe in the eyes of someone will never count to much, but I'm going to submit my hand to the master pot. Amen. And God will put a treasure there. Yes, yes, the treasure of the Holy Spirit yes. that dwells within. Yes, the parakletos, the one who comes alongside to help us and to encourage us and to, to strengthen us. There's a treasure on the inside of you. When you came to faith in Christ, when the Holy Spirit came to take residence inside of you, he brought with him a spiritual gift or gifts. Yes. And you are marvelously and wonderfully made. In the image of God, created in the image of Christ. And God has given you life and time and opportunity because there's something that God wants to accomplish on the earth that can only be accomplished in and through your life. Amen. I believe that. I believe that until God is through doing with me what he wants to do, mm -hmm. it ain't anybody can do to, to stop me. That there's something God wants me to do, and that's my responsibility to find out what it is. Amen to pursue it, to follow hard after it. And as the heart beats, as the, as the deer pants for the water brooks, I must pant after God and long after him and want his will to be done in my life even when it's inconvenient, even when it's painful, even when it's distracting. But in so doing, mm -hmm. I find the purpose for which God gave me life. Amen. Are you following me? Amen. We have a treasure, beloved. Yes, we, we have a treasure. And, and because we have a treasure, we don't lose heart. We don't faint. We don't give up. We don't throw in the towel. We continue to persevere because we know that God is at work. Amen. And he which began a good work in you, he will complete it. He'll perform it into the day of Christ. Amen. True, true. Let me move on. Right. Not only do we have a ministry, mercy, a message, and a treasure. Look at what else Paul said. Mm -hmm. 
and verse 8. Paul was a realist. He lived in the real world. He did not have this head in the sand like the proverbial ostrich. Uh -huh. Paul knew that opposition was real. When they were stoning him, when they left him for dead, when they were beating him, Paul didn't say, well, I'm not really being beat. I'm not going to claim this beating. Paul was not into this mental, spiritual gymnastics nonsense of denying reality. Paul knew there were people that were on his case trying to do him bodily harm. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to impede the progress that God was moving forward in his life. Paul knew that. So Paul said, I'm living in the real world now. Yeah. I got this ministry, this mercy, this message. I got this treasure. I'm no fool. I tell my children at the office, I didn't get to be as old as I am being no fool. All right. You just can't tell me anything. You just can't run any line down there. All right. All right. Yeah. I, did, I didn't just wake up this morning. I didn't just get off the bus. All right. All right. I've been running block a few times. Yeah. Thought I was slick, so I know them games you're trying to run. And you got to come with something better than that. But I'll say, we're troubled on every side. Yeah. You ever feel just troubled on every side? Just him in on every side, pressure coming from every side. Paul said the trouble on every side is real, yet I'm not distressed. All right. I'm not going to be stressed out about it, That's right. what he said. Yeah. Paul said, I'm not going to get stressed out over this. I'm not going to have a nervous breakdown because of it. Paul said, I know the bills are due. They can't put me in jail over it. Are you following me? Right. There's no debt as prison to thank God for that in 2000. Yeah. So the worst they can do is come and take their stuff back. It's old now, broke down, don't work anyway. They can have it if they want it. Preach, that guy, preach. Thank you, brother. <laughs> I'm not going to be stressed out about it. He says, I'm not at the point of distress. I am perplexed. There are some things that I don't understand at times. I cannot figure it out at times. I don't understand how parents can pray and bring their children up in the nurture and the happiness of the Lord. I don't understand how parents can sacrifice and give. I don't understand how parents can do everything that a parent can do and the children still go spiritually insane. I don't understand that. But I got my scars in my own body, my own soul to know it's a reality. I don't understand it, but I'm not going to walk away from God because of it. And some of you parents just spend far too much time worried about what your children have done. All you can do is all you can do. At the end of the day, commit them to God and say, Lord, into your hands I commend them. I'm going to serve you until the day that I die, regardless of whatever I else decide to do. So I am perplexed, he says. There's some things I don't understand at times. I don't always understand the plan of God. But I know that I can trust the hand of God. Amen. Even when I don't understand the plan of God, I can trust his hand because I know he will never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. So there's nothing wrong with being perplexed. There's nothing wrong with admitting I'm confused. There's nothing wrong with admitting I'm troubled in my mind. There's nothing at all wrong with admitting that and acknowledging it as being a reality. But at the same time, Paul says, I'm not giving up. I'm not at the point of despair. Are you following me? I'm not at the point of desperation where I'm going to go out here and jump off 35th Street Bridge. He said, I think too much of myself to do myself any bodily harm. He said, there's nothing wrong with thinking enough of yourself and not wanting yourself any bodily harm. So Paul says, I'm not at the point of despair. Come what may, Jesus Christ still reigns in glory. And one day I'm going to reign with him. So I'm not going to be at the point of despair. I'm not going to lose heart. I'm not going to faint. I'm not going to sit down on God. I'm not going to turn my back and walk away from what God has called me to do. Amen. He says, even though persecuted, yes. but I'm never forsaken. Right. I'm never forsaken. Right. And that's the promise of Jesus. I will never leave you nor forsake you, the writer of Hebrews said, Hebrews 13. Right. He says, therefore, you can be Content with what things that you have. Whatever your lot in life is, you can be content and be satisfied with it because the promise of Christ is that he will never leave you nor forsake you. All right. So you're always sufficient. And you always have the sufficiency that you need to do what God has called you to do because he promises his presence. Amen. As we move to close, verse 16. And read those other verses. Mm -hmm. And it leads up to verse 16. Mm -hmm. 
Paul says, for which cause we don't faint, we don't lose heart. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Paul says the reality of the physical deterioration is real. The outward man, he's perishing. Amen. We can fix him up, we can dress him up, we can jog, we can get on, do the calisthenics, and we can get on the exercise bicycle, and we ought to do all those things, keep the cholesterol down, keep the heart working right, keep the mind clear, but ultimately, mm -hmm. the outward man perishes. Amen. The outward man perishes. Right. Paul says, but the inward man, mm -hmm. he's been renewed Amen. day by day. Amen. But the inward man, man, has been strengthened day by day. And as I feed on the word of God and fellowship with God in prayer, discharge my ministry and service, the inward man is being renewed, he says, being strengthened day by day. Mm -hmm. Someone says there are two natures that beat within my breast. Yes. The one is vile, the other is blessed. The one I love, the other I hate. But the one I feed, he dominates. And as I feed the new man, yes, he strengthened. And I stand tall, bold, and courageously in the heat of spiritual battle, and I don't lose heart. Paul says, for our light afflictions, he called it light affliction. Been stoned, shipwrecked, been beaten, been maligned and persecuted. Paul says, it's nothing but light affliction. When it's compared to the eternal weight and glory, it's only been for a moment, children. Suffering don't last forever. Amen. Hard times don't last forever. Right. Crying don't last forever. Joy is coming in the morning for the people of God, for the children of God. So hold on a little while longer. For your light affliction is working for you a far more than exceeding the eternal weight and glory. Well, Paul says we don't lose heart mm -hmm. because we understand. That everything that we see is temporal. That's right, sir. Don't you know that the things that we spend most of our times preoccupied with, those things are temporal. Amen. True. Those things are not eternal. <laughs> and the things that are eternal in value and in significance, no one can ever touch them. Amen. No one can touch the love that I have for my wife and my children and my brothers and my sisters. No one can touch the love that I have for the church, the love that I have for God. No one can touch away the love that God has for me. No one can touch the spiritual inheritance that God has desired for all of us. Those things are eternal. Amen. So we understand and we keep things in perspective, the things of real value and the things of real worth and the things of real significance are safely reserved in heaven for us and can never be taken away from us. So Paul says, we don't lose our Amen. Now somebody came here this morning. Someone came here and, and divorce has been on your mind. Come on. As a matter of fact, that's on a lot of folks' minds. <laughs> because marital problems are real. That's right. And it's hard to make it work. All right. And it's hard to live together in, in marriage bliss. Mm -hmm. But divorce is not the answer. Now, I understand that some of you, you, you've had no choice. Someone has literally driven you through that, through their, through their unfaithfulness, All right. through their unwillingness to dwell with you in honor and to be pleased to dwell with you until you've had no choice. All right. But others of you are looking for an easy out. <clears throat> Thinking that the grass is green on the other side. It always looked green. They use a different fertilizer. Come on, Pastor. It always looked good. They just die in the grass, that's all. When you get over there, you find it still is hard to cut. It still has to be mowed. From a distance, you can't see the dandelion. I was looking at my neighbor's grass. His grass always looked better than my grass. I went over his yard. He got as much crab grass, as many dandelions as I have. His look good from a distance. But up close and personal, he's dealing with the same things that I'm dealing with. And that's the way it is with a marriage and with family life. You might as well hold on to the one you got. The songwriter said it's cheap to keep them, brother. <laughs> it's cheap to keep them. You got to pay for them anyhow. You might as well keep them and work with them and work the kinks out and work the flaws out. 
And then one day, Peter said, Lord, look what I did with this thing. Look, look how I worked on it. Because of your mercy, because of the ministry, because of your grace, Lord, look what I was able to do by your grace. And God will say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now enter thou into the eternal glories and the presence of God. You know, one, of my, one of my heroes passed away uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, coach, former coach of the Dallas Cowboys, Coach Tom Landry. And I was getting ready to come to church this morning. I was checking on the uh, ESPN and, and listening. And they were doing this little tribute to, to Coach Landry. And, it's kind of amazing that the players were talking about it. One player, Randy White, played for him for 14 years. So I never saw the man lose his cool. I never heard the man use profanity. I never heard the man be angry from his bitterness or wrath. At the end of the epitaph, mm -hmm. they said he leaves to mourn his wife of 50 plus years. Mm -hmm. I said, what a testimony. Yes, sir. Amen. Well, it's just a man who had risen to great stature and great position and promise, but he never outgrew the wife of his youth. Amen. Never found a need to trade her in for a new mom, but kept her until the end. Amen. There's something to be said about that. Yes, sir. There's something to be said about that. And so we shouldn't lose heart. We shouldn't faint because we're having trouble in our families and trouble in our marriages and trouble with our children. We keep on serving God and believing that, that the greater the opposition the greater the opposition, the more magnanimous the problem, the more stupendous the solution. Amen. And when God shows up, he shows up real big. Amen. And when God does something that you, yes, you can't even imagine right. that God might be able to do, and it's going to bless your heart. Yes. Can, can I testify just for a moment? Yes, Amen. Yeah, as, I, as I shared with you yesterday, you know, my heart has been a little heavy uh, because of my oldest daughter's situation. I'm never ashamed of my children. If some of y'all expect me to be shamed, you're wrong. Uh -huh. right. You're wrong. You're very wrong. Come on, Ray. You're very wrong. <laughs> never be ashamed of my children. I never deny one of my children. I don't care if they become a serial killer. I'll stand right there in the court and plead for them. Lord, Judge, have mercy on me. That's my, that's my baby, Judge. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. But the Lord has just been ministering to my heart and encouraging my heart. About the great privilege and the honor to see uh, another generation. Come on, man. Come on. I could have died when, before I saw the next generation. All right. Wish the situation and circumstances could be different, but I'm blessing God and thanking That's Him. Right. I say, Lord, give me a chance to touch this next generation. Yes, yes. That we keep a godly seed right. and carry on in the name of the Lord. Amen. Even in darkness, my beloved friends, God shows up in mercy. Yes. And He encourages our hearts. Say, so keep trusting me and keep believing me. And don't ever sell me short. Yes, sir. Don't lose heart. Yes, sir. Don't faint. Don't throw in the towel. Victory is right around the corner. Amen. And then maybe you fail. We've all failed. Yes, we have. We all have our water gates, our Iran country gates, and <laughs> some even our own Monica gates. <laughs> and so we all need the mercies of God. Amen. We all need the forgiveness of God. Yes, we do. And we all need to know that God is a God who's able to meet us when we're at our lowest point. Yes, he is. At our very lowest point. Yes. He's able to meet us right there. Right there. Lift us up. Strengthen us. Yes, sir. And encourage us. Amen. Amen. And what will blow your mind is that he will use you yes, he will. to do something, do something. That's it. when you're at your lowest point. Amen. Don't lose heart. Keep on believing. It. Keep on trusting. It. As I close, one of the great preachers, not because he's a great theologian, because he's a man of great passion mm -hmm. and great compassion for peoples, Dr. Edward Victor Hill. Mm -hmm. And Dr. E.D. Hill tells a story of growing up in Sweet Home, Texas, mm -hmm. in dirt poverty. His right. mother had to give him away acting because she couldn't raise him and his brothers and sisters, and she gave him away to another family. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how that he would be out picking cotton. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman who owned this state would come and walk out on his veranda porch. Mm -hmm. And he would stretch on the veranda porch. He overlooked all the people out there picking cotton in his field. And he said, he said to his mama, he said, Mama, one day I'm going to have me a house like that. Mm -hmm. And have me a veranda, and I'm going to come out every morning. I'm just going to walk around and stretch. <laughs> and he'll 
said I was just a big old, big head Negro boy, and they laughed at me. He said, oh, big head, he, he never went out of the house like that. <laughs> he said his mama said, keep on believing, boy. Yes, sir. Come on, keep on, keep on believing. That's it. He says he always loved automobiles. And he said, beautiful, shiny new automobiles would come down the street. He said, then the poor people's car would come and spit and smoke and dripping oil and leaving a cloud of dust. And he'd look at the new cars and wonder how near a car like that. Everybody laughed and make fun of him. Mama said, keep on believing, boy. Keep on believing. Keep on believing. That's right. He'll say, now, I'm not one who have a great affection for material things. Mm -hmm. He said, out in Los Angeles, I got me a house mm -hmm. and got a veranda. Yeah. So every morning I come, I step out on the veranda and I stretch. Yeah. And I remember living down in Sweet Home, down in yeah. dirt poverty. Yeah. And I remember the faith of my mother telling me to keep on believing, boy. That's right. Keep on believing. And what I say to you is keep on believing. That's it, that's it. Keep on trusting God. Keep yeah, on hoping. Right. Don't ever lose hope. Don't ever lose your train. Don't ever lose your passion. Don't let, ever, any, let anyone extinguish the fire that burns in your heart for doing something significant for God. For your life amounted to something significant for God. You keep on believing. Amen. And don't lose hope. Yeah. Let's pray, shall we? Amen. Father, we thank you and we bless you and we praise you. That you're the God who lifts heavy hearts and spirits that are down. And Lord, as I look out over this congregation, and I see many of your choice servants, and some of them are going through difficulty. And I pray that you would encourage them and lift their spirit today. Let them know, Lord, that you've seen a struggle. You know in intimate detail the dilemma. And you're going to provide mercy and grace to help them to continue to move on. Father, there's one of the son of my voice that's never come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let them know that forgiveness, that pardon, that salvation is available. But they must recognize their need that they have sinned against you. They've broken your law. Yes, Lord. And there's nothing they can do to undo the wrong they've done. They cannot take away their own sin. Yes. But you have provided a way for them to be forgiven. You sent your only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he lived a perfectly sinless life. He was betrayed and crucified, and there on the cross, you punished him for our sins. The punishment that we deserve was thrust upon Jesus. Yes. He died in our place. Yes, he did. And you raised him from the dead, declaring that you were satisfied that you accepted the death of your son as full and complete payment for sin. And that whoever calls on the name of the Lord, rich, poor, black, white, male, female, whoever will say, Lord Jesus, Save me. Yes, yes. You'll hear their cry and you'll save yes, you If there's one this morning, Lord, will you save them? Save them from their sins. Save them from their hopelessness and despair. Save them from their anxiety and frustration. Save them, Lord. And grant them your peace and the assurance of knowing that they're going to spend all eternity with you. If there's one that's backslidden, speak to them, Father. They may decide today to follow you, to live for you. There's one looking for a church home that you've already saved. If you've moved in their heart and you persuaded them that this is where they should unite, they should unite and work, then your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a spiritual need, you sense God speaking to you, you will to come. Don't be ashamed.